Okay. Um, good morning and a welcome. We're delighted this morning uh, to have with us live at 5 p.m. from Zichron Yaakov, right? Right, that's right. In Israel, uh, Rabbi Elisha Wolfen. Uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Wolfen is like, it can be likened to Adin Steinsaltz, the famous Talmudist, in that he was brought up on a kibbutz. No, he didn't become, you know, Haredi, but he, he, he came to the United States. He was born and raised on Kfar Hanasi uh, in, in, the, in the Galil. Uh, he, uh, he studied Islam and Arabic as an undergraduate became a shaliach in Northern California Hillels. And as he, he half jokingly wrote me, he says, I went to America, America as an Israeli and returned home to Israel seven years later as a Jew. <laughs> and also studied at University of Judaism uh, uh, in Los Angeles, transferred to the Schechner Institute in Jerusalem and received his smicha, his rabbinic ordination in 2001. He's among the founders or the founding rabbi of Kehilat Vehavta and Zichron Yaakov, um, which numbers 250 members now and is very active in the Masorti movement. So we're delighted to have you this morning. Uh, this, this evening for you, this morning for us, uh, Rabbi Wolfen, who will be talking to us on the issue of God in our image or the idea. God in our image. Take it away, Rabbi Wolfen. <laughs> Rabbi, Rabbi Wolfen, we know one of your members, Lisa Lissack. Of course, of course. So I'll send that. So it's Ed, Ed, and Barbara. Barbara. Okay, yeah. I'll tell her. Right. So, um, because she lived uh, by you guys, right? That's um. Yes. South Orange. She lives in Great Metro West. Yeah. She right. Yeah. She right. moved there. All right, so she, now she's she's uh, here in Zichon Yaakov. Um, so I hope you guys are doing okay during this um, crazy and interesting time. Um, um, are, are you? Everyone's okay? I can stand. Uh, uh, have you already been vaccinated? Have you received the first or second vaccines? Yes. So Kathy has. Some, some yes. Some yes, okay. I had not, one. Not yet. I had the first one. The first, the first. Kathy, yeah. you had both? No, one. Susan also. Okay, okay. Um, and Ed and Barbara, did you already receive your vaccinations? On Tuesday, the first one. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Which one, by the way, which one of the vaccines are you... Um... Wait, you're, you're muted? You're, you're muted. Yeah. I'll unmute. Moderna. Uh, Moderna. How is this the Moderna? Ah, with Moderna. Okay. Okay. So I wonder what your uh, tail is going to look like. Um, ours is, uh, um, we're with Pfizer. So, um, um, I don't know if that's become the, 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 uh, the ongoing joke um, by you guys, but here um, there's so much, uh, um, so much uh, misinformation about the vaccines um, that today there are a lot more vaccines available than people who want to be vaccinated. And, oh, really? And, wow. and, yeah, yeah. Anyone who wanted to, I've already had both my shots, both vaccines. Anyone who wants to get vaccinated can get vaccinated, both shots. Um, wow. And many are um, refusing because of, of misinformation, disinformation. Wow. Um, and the joke is, you know, everyone comes out of the out of their first vaccine in the second and reporting to his friends about the tail, the tail they've grown. That's, you know, that's part of the- Oh, the, oh, oh. <laughs> that, was part of the, that was part of the joke. That's why I wanted to. I thought only we were so benighted. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so our, our topic is, uh, um, first of all, God is my favorite topic. Um, um, I was, as, um, as Jeremy mentioned, I was born and raised uh, secular and on a, on a kibbutz, on a secular kibbutz, but I've always, always very, been very drawn to spirituality. And, um, um, 
Um, and I don't think I called it God because of my kibbutz where I was born and raised, you weren't really allowed to talk about God. God, um, you know, was, um, was shunned. Um, but my grandmother was a religious woman and I was very close to my grandmother. Um, I was her first grandchild. So I had many, many, many years of, 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 of her. And um, she lived in Jerusalem. In, and she, we would have arguments. Boy, did we have arguments. We would yell, scream, shout. We had a chavruta. I didn't know it was called chavruta, but that's really <laughs> cool. in her little kitchen in Jerusalem. You know, I would, I would, um, you know, yell out um, all kinds of like socialist propaganda, and she would yell back all kinds of religious propaganda. Um, I felt I had to defend, um, you know, where I came from. So, um, and she always said, she always said, you know, Alicia, one day, one day you will see, one day you will see the light. <laughs> I, guess she was, I guess she was right, and she even lived to see it. So that's, um, um, but we've been always close, whether I saw the light or didn't. Um, so, so God is, is a favorite, is indeed a favorite um, topic of mine. Um, and we did a course um, in our Kihila here in Zichon Yaakov. Um, we have like year long courses, like I'm sure you, you guys have as well. That's, um, you know, that's, how, that's what Jews do, they study Torah. Um, and, uh, and every year we have like a, a main theme. And, and one year, was about two years ago, I think, our theme was um, a yearly examination of the way Jews encountered God throughout the ages. How, um, how Jews, the relationship Jews had with God. Um, so when I, when I say about like, the image of God, um, I'm, I'm not coming to, to, to say here that, you know, ah, God is only something we created in our image. Um, but the way we talk about God and the, the form that God has, um, has um, taken in Jewish text, in the Torah, throughout the ages, the changing of form that, that the divine has taken, I, I think it is in, in our own image. And I'll, and I'll explain that. We'll, it'll be very, very clear. If now it seems a bit like, what is he talking about? It'll become very, very clear shortly. Um, and... Um, and it, there are two, there are two um, great um, scholar, scholars and, and, and scholarships that we're, I'm going to be kind of conversing with in a way. One is um, Maimonides. Maimonides, you know, one of the greatest, you know, the greatest uh, Jewish philosopher, um, halachic authority, doctor, um, who died in 1204, 1208, um, um, something like that. Um, you know, it was his part of his philosophy that, you know, God has no image whatsoever. When you talk about God, you can only talk about what God isn't. And um, there's nothing you can say uh, about God in the, in, the, uh, in the positive, saying God is. You can't even say God is merciful. God is loving. God is forgiving. He, he claims anything we say about God is idolatrous. And... Um, and God is, is the ultimate Ein Sof, the ultimate, um, do you know, if you know the word Ein Sof? Is that a word that, yeah, um, like the ultimate, it's not just infinity, it means infinity, Ein Sof, God is infinite, but in the word, um, in Hebrew, Ein Sof. So literally it means, Ein means, you know, has no Sof, no limit, no end. But God is the ultimate Ein, the ultimate nothingness. Now, nothingness from meaning God is the ultimate no thingness. If we have a thing, then it's not God. Then it's not God. And um, so when we when we are talking about God being merciful and God being you know loving, whatever, Maimonides would say that's just a figure of speech. It's a metaphor. That's all it is. God is not truly forgiving. God is not truly, yeah, God is also forgiving, perhaps, you know, it's one of the attributes, but it's, um, he claims the Torah is all metaphoric language, it's all allegory. Um, he's not the first one who said it, um, but he certainly um, um, was one of the big, uh, one of the most important philosophers who said that. 
So that's one, one piece of um, wisdom that I think we, we need to remember. The other is a much more modern piece of wisdom that the conservative movement kind of uh, adopted. Today, it's, um, it evolved since the 19th and 20th centuries when it was developed. The idea of, um, you know, the um, JEPD, are you familiar with the famous, famous um, 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 Torah scholarship? Um, the, some texts were, were J, I, E, Adonai texts. Some texts were E, were Elohim texts. Others were priestly texts, anything to do with the um, Mishkan uh, and Mikdash. And then the D is Deuteronomy. Um, and what that can, comes to explain is who is the writer? It doesn't talk about God. It asks who's the writer? Who wrote that part of the Torah? So we're not gonna be talking about that. That's not what we're gonna be addressing. However, what we are taking from there is, is there's a beautiful, and we didn't need modern scholarship for that. We have traditional scholarship as well. That kind of asks whenever Adonai is mentioned, hmm, what quality is that? Whenever Elohim is mentioned, what quality is that? And then, and now there are many, many, many names um, to God in the, in the Torah, um, but what well, many? There are quite a few names to uh, um, God in the Torah, and there are many names for God not in the Torah, like later on, both in the rest of the Tanakh, the Bible, and later on in rabbinical writings. But what we're going to be, going to be um, exploring, we're going to be exploring in our two sessions, four four of the classical, classical names. Um, and one obviously is, is Adonai. No, you can't not talk about Adonai. The other is Elohim. The third is, which the third is actually what we're gonna be starting with, even though it's not the first in the Torah. And um, we're gonna be starting with El Shaddai. El Shaddai is, um, is, a, very, uh, is a very, very important, important name. Remember, we're talking about names. The names are the different aspects of God, the different aspects. And why did, why did each name, why did each aspect appear? What, what brought about its appearance? What does it respond to? What does it help us with? And finally, the, the fourth one is just the word, the name El. El. I don't know how much you're familiar with very often in, in Hebrew, in modern Hebrew, when you talk about God, the generic name for God is either Elohim or El. You ask, you know, you want to say, oh, thank God. Todala El. Todala, that's thank God. That's the generic name for God. Um, another, um, what well, you may be familiar with is, is uh, um, um, well, you know, we'll talk more about it when we get to El. Today we're going to be starting with most with El Shaddai. Now I have a request, but we're, we're a small group. So at any point you want to, I don't know, barge in, ask. I'll stop once in a while to see if there's any comments or questions. But feel free to, I know you're not Israeli, so you're polite. Um, so, but the least you can do is, is, I don't know, just raise your hand and then I'll shut up for once. And, and, and it'll be great if you, if you guys talk as well. Ask, comment, disagree, whatever, whatever it may be. I certainly don't hold, um, I don't have yeah. any holding on to the truth. So, um, so before we dive into our subject matter, I don't know, any comment, question, anything you want to? Yeah, Rabbi, feminists are very upset about the portrayal of God as male. Will you be talking about whether God has a gender or is perceived as male, a why? That's really interesting you're asking me. Usually, well, the classical answer is usually, um, <clears throat> that's what Kabbalah did. Kabbalah was, Kabbalah basically introduced the feminine aspect of God. Um, so we're talking about the 12th, 12th century um, common era. And that's when the feminine aspect of God in, called Shechina, Shechina, um, which means like presence, but it really already appears 
in, in, at the end of uh, Shemot, at the end of Exodus, with the building of the tabernacle, when God is described as a dwelling, God dwells in the tent. And that's considered a feminine aspect of God. So in that regard, since we're talking about the Torah, I won't be talking a lot about the feminine aspect. However, and that's why it's interesting that you made that comment. The figure we're going to be meeting today, El Shaddai, El Shaddai is very much a feminine aspect of God. Mm. Um, people don't usually regard it as feminine, but even the word itself comes from Shaddai. Shaddai comes from the word Shaddai. Shaddai in Hebrew, modern Hebrew today, is breasts. Breasts are, um, are you know, that's basically Shaddai. Um, so it's the, it's the, uh, it's certainly a very feminine aspect of, of God, and we'll, I'll, I'll say more, more about it um, right now. So thank you for that comment or question. Anyone else? Anything else before? And you can ask at any point, so it's not as if uh, it's now or never, um, or comment at any point. So, um, El Shaddai. I'm going to, I want to read, and I have to say, I, I should have prepared as a text to share, but I wanted to most like share like verbally because when we share, I lose sight of the people. Um, and uh, so maybe next week I will do some more, some more sharing. Usually in my classes here, I do, but I know the people. So, so kind of, um, I don't need to see them. Um, but here I feel like I, I do need to see. Um, so we really should have started with either Adonai or Elohim, especially because the first chapter of Bereshit is Elohim. Second chapter of Bereshit, and we'll talk about that, is Adonai. Just so I get a sense, is that what I just said now? Is that known? Is that, you all know that, right? You all, yeah, okay, great. Or maybe, maybe not. Okay, so we will delve deeper into it anyway. I just want to know just how much of the, Usually when, when, when this thing is discussed in English, people talk about God. There's a generic name, God. And that's problematic because, um, because then you miss out on all these different names. And it's not a coincidence that you have all these different names. So if we just use the word God, um, we're missing out on something. And that's what we're trying to reclaim kind of today. Um, so in the book of Shmot, the second book of the of the of the Torah, in the book of uh, um, of, of um, Exodus, in, there are two interesting encounters. One encounter, which we'll read also, but we'll read that second, is the encounter between God and Moshe at the burning bush, at the burning bush, um, where God introduce, introduces God's self. We'll come back to that. With that, Moshe goes down to Egypt. And when he goes down to Egypt, um, reluctantly, he didn't want to go, as we all know. Um, he goes down to Egypt and he comes, him and Aaron come before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh thinks it's the funniest thing he's ever heard. Let my people go. And it sounds like a wonderful joke. And for him, it's a sign, uh-oh, the people are bored. You know, if they can start, you know, asking for and um, complaining, whining and asking for freedom, they must be, um, you know, they have too much time on their hands, and he makes the slavery that much more burdensome, right? From that point on, um, somewhere towards the end of, of the first Parsha in, in Exodus, uh, Pharaoh says, from now on, you will um, build the same amount of, of daily, uh, the daily quarter of bricks, but now you are going to be looking for, um, for the materials, for the materials to build the bricks. Until now, we provide the, the, the materials, you build the bricks and build the buildings. Now you'll provide you will make the bricks, build the buildings, but you will go scout out the materials for the bricks. And the children of Israel turn to Moshe and they say to him, you know, who who asked, who asked you to come here? You're just causing trouble. Like what what, what you know, which is a reminder. But things were not that bad. 
You know, one of the things I think uh, when I when I work with bar mitzvah kids, especially, I love poking that um, that truth that they learned um, in uh, here. It's not in religious school. Here it's you know their day school because we learned it at school, and how Egypt it was terrible. We worked so hard. Things were awful. No, it wasn't. It absolutely wasn't. We see it throughout the Torah that if a week after leaving Egypt, all they want to do is go back to Egypt. It could not possibly have been that bad. Auschwitz was bad. No one ever, ever, ever has any thought of the flesh pots, you know, God forbid, of, um, of, of Auschwitz. But Egypt wasn't that bad, which is a really interesting question about, you know, what is complaining all about? You know, very often we complain, you know, and we all complain. It's part of our lives, part of being human, part of being Jewish. We complain, we whine, we complain. They didn't want to leave Egypt. The, um, the makot, the plagues, I think were more for a show for the children of Israel than they were for, for Pharaoh. So they turned to Moshe and they said to him, just, 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 just go, just go. You're just causing more trouble than anything else. And Moshe is stunned. He didn't want this mission in the first place. Why? Like, you know, they, they don't want to leave Egypt. So why? So God, why did you send me there? And the second Parsha, towards the end of the first Parsha, he turns to God and says, like, you know, what do you want from me? Pharaoh mocks me. The children of Israel don't even want to hear from me anymore. You know, why do you send me? And that's where God says to Moshe something really beautiful and profound. He says, really beautiful. And that's how Parashat Va'era, the second parasha, um, um, the second parasha begins. And it's exactly what we're talking about. So I'm going to read it from, uh, you know, the, the conservative uh, um, Chumash. So we all speak in the same language. In, so this is the following. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. Now here you have to see what's written in the Hebrew. The Lord. Okay, what's the Lord? Elohim el Moshe Ani Adonai. So you think, okay, okay, I'm the Lord. Usually we don't stop and we're not shocked by the statement, but we should be. This is a turning point in the narrative of the Jewish people. It's a turning point in the narrative of the Torah. It's a turning point in the narrative of, of the human race. A new divine character is born here. Now, it was kind of born a little bit in the burning bush. We'll read that in a second, too. But listen what he says. I appeared, okay, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai. But I did not make myself known to them by my name Adonai, Hashem, Havaya, however you want to call it. <coughs> I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, etc., 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 etc. Now, usually we read through these two sentences and we don't make too much of it. This is huge. First of all, he says, Moshe, I have really important news for you. I'm Adonai. Nice to meet you. Your ancestors, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, they did not know the word Adonai. They did not. Now, we think they did, because, you know, in, in chapter 12 in, in Bereshit, where God says to Abraham, you know, go forth, it's Adonai speaking. When, when God says to Abraham to sacrifice his son, it's, it's Adonai speaking. But he doesn't appear, Abraham doesn't know God as Adonai. Leave it. He knows him as El Shaddai. As El Shaddai. And, and the big question is, who is? Who is El Shaddai? Why is he saying this? Why did our ancestors not know Adonai, but they knew El Shaddai? 
and what our next our next hero will be Adonai. So we're going to go with the, with our ancestors first of all. Explore who was El Shaddai. What was his call to fame, and then who was Adonai? So before now, we explore further. Any any comments or questions? Anything? Yeah, go ahead, Jeremy. Yeah, uh, every time you say Adonai, you're referring to Yud Hey Vav Hey. Yes. Yes. So so for those who don't know the Yah Yahweh or Yud Hey, so Adonai is always Yud Hey Vav Hey, and and so this is the first time that God says, "I am." Yudhei Vavhe, I am Adonai, or but but haven't we seen Adonai? Does not Adonai does not Adonai appear before Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Absolutely, absolutely. So, the second chapter <laughs> in Bereshit he appears. We yeah. that's why it's so that's why that's why we never that's why we never make a big deal out of this these two um, two verses. We the reader, we have you know is all over the text. Right. But but Abraham from Abraham's perspective. He knew El Shaddai. Ah. So, who is El Shaddai? Who is El Shaddai? Any, any, any idea? Any, I don't know, intuitive guess or idea? Maybe someone actually knows from prior studying. What's the quality? We're asking you about the quality of El Shaddai, because it's going to be a very different quality <coughs> to that of Adonai. It's going to be the opposite quality, in fact. Even though God is one, Shema Israel, you know, here are Israel, and the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. God is one. But God appears to all of us in different qualities in every given moment. One moment he can appear in one quality, the next in another. So what's the quality of El Shaddai? El Shaddai... Um, I'll explain by, by, by the, through the narrative of the Torah. We have the story of Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve beget, you know, they beget, they beget, they beget, um, and uh, so-and-so was born, and so-and-so lived so many years, and had, and, that's an, and this moves on, 10 generations after Adam and Eve, Noah, 10 generations after Noah, Abraham, and all's great, and everybody is having kids and they're all um, um, you know they're filling the earth with human beings which is wonderful and then all of a sudden the narrative comes to a halting screech mamash screech which again hardly anybody notices and i'm going to read you what that screech is if by chance you have a chumash that's fine next time i will i will um, prepared um, as a text to share, but I'm going to read it to you anyway, so you don't need to have a chumash. And um, it's before Lech Lecha, before we are introduced, really introduced to Abraham, it's the very end of Parashat Noach, the end of chapter 11. Um, something really dramatic happens, and because we know it, we, we're not alarmed. We're not like shaken. We're not shocked. So, it's right after the story of the Tower of Babel. The children of Israel um, have, um, the, the, the humanity has dispersed throughout the earth. And there again, they're, um, they're becoming many, many, many. Um, and, and then, Mamash, before the end of the Parsha, it says the following. Um, so verse 26, in case you are following, when Terach had lived 70 years, he begot Abraham. Terach is Abraham's father. Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Now, this is the line of Terach. That's what the partials are. You know, who begot who? Terach begot Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begot Lot. Haran died in the lifetime of his father, Terach, in his native land or of the Chaldeans. In Iraq of today, Abram, Abram, Avram, and Nahor took to themselves wives, the name of Avram's wife being Sarai, and that of Nahor's wife, Milka, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milka and Iska. Now Sarai was barren, she had no 
child. Now, we know she was barren, and so was Rebecca, and so was Rachel. They were all barren, so we keep on reading. But this is a huge, just like the story in the second, the second Parsha in, in, in Exodus was a, a screech here too. All of a sudden, no one was barren until now. Everybody begot and begat, and everybody had children. And oh, suddenly, and suddenly, Sarai was barren, she had no child. Screech, it's like a halt in the story. Is screech a, a proper term? Is that a, is that a, yeah? Sure. Screeching okay. halt. A screeching halt. Okay. Um, English is not my native language. So, um, um, now, we have to understand that this is, today we know, um, you know, my, my wife and I, we, we were barren too. You know, we could not have children. Um, and we ended up adopting. Um, so I very much, um, I feel very, very, um, drawn to this um, to this text, um, but the story here changes. Why does it change? Because for the first time, the first time, um, we have a clan, a family that is migrating. Because what happens next? Because she was barren, Terach took his son Avram, his grandson Lot, the son of Haran. He's not the son of Abraham. And his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abraham, and they set out together from Ur of, of the Chaldeans for the land of Canaan, way before God appeared to Abraham and said, go forth to the land that I will show you. They were already on their way to the land of Canaan. People, don't, people usually miss that little piece. But when they had come <clears throat> as far as Haran, they settled there. They camped there. The days of Terach came to 250 years, and Terach died in Haran. They were on the way. Now, Terach started the journey to the land of Canaan. Why? Because Sarai was barren. Sarai was barren. And the understanding at the time was, in Hebrew, there's a beautiful term. It's called Mishane makom, mishane mazal. A change of place is a change of luck. Mazal doesn't mean luck, by the way. Mazal actually means, you know, we say mazal tov, you know, good luck. Mazal means star. Mazal is actually the biblical and then the rabbinical word for star. Because in every, every place is governed by different, a different sign. It's the world of astrology. According to the sages, Abraham was an astrologer. Abraham was an astrologer, I don't know if you know that. And um, when Abraham, when God, when God says to Abraham, look to the heavens, look at, this, at the stars. He says, what do the rabbis say? Like, why look to the heavens, look at the stars? You know, why? The, the rabbis, the sages say, look, I know you're an astrologer and I know it's not written in the stars that you're going to have a child, but you are going to have a child. Forget astrology, drop astrology. You know, astrology is from the from from um, or of the Chaldeans. That's they were very. It was very big astrology there. Um, connect to something else, and we'll talk about that something else. Um, so basically, whenever we have um, a halt in the story, a stoppage. In the story, a new God has to appear. Has to. A new appearance of God has to appear. Until now, there was no challenge. They, you know, they had many children. Everything was okay. Same thing for us as well. We had to reinvent God after the Holocaust. The Jewish, Jewish thinking before the Holocaust and Jewish thinking after the Holocaust is not the same Jewish thinking. Because we now had to come up with a new theology, a new understanding of God. So many people abandoned their faith in God because of what happened in the Holocaust, because they had a somewhat childish, childish understanding of God. You know, if you're good, God will be good to you too. If you're good, you're going to be, 
in, even though we know we don't need the Holocaust to know that that does not work that way. We know that there are very good people who suffer, who, who die young, who are barren, who go through all kinds of things, whose businesses collapse, even though they were really, you know, they were, they were good people. Why do bad things happen to good people? Only after the Holocaust, when 1,500,000 children, who were certainly, you know, innocent, um, did not do anything, if they were, um, if, if, if they were slaughtered, like, what kind of God is that? So either there's no God, or we have to rethink God. And, um, you know, Elie Wiesel lost God that night, that fateful night when he lost God. And, and he spent the rest of his life trying to reconcile God for himself. And he found it through Hasidic teachings, but he wrestled, he wrestled because he needed another understanding of God. Now we're too close to the Holocaust to really see what new God emerged for us. We're too close historically speaking, but I'm pretty sure 500 years from now, when they're going to be studying our period, they're going to be noticing a new, a new discourse, a new name for God will appear. The generic name will still be God, but, um, but he'll have a new attribute. In Hebrew, he may be called, um, I'll give you an example. An example is, um, I personally connect with God being the infinite. You know, the infinite. I love that term, the infinite which is a Kabbalistic term. And the infinite works perfectly well with the Holocaust. The infinite, there's no clash between the God of the infinite and what happened in the Holocaust. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna go into it right now. You know, we can at some point, but um, that God merciful, God merciful, mm, that's a tough one after the Holocaust. And a very personal God who takes care of each and every one of us. I, I do believe in that, by the way. I do believe in that. But, um, but not in a simplistic sense at all. At all. It had to be a lot more philosophical first before I could get to the intimate God. Um, Kathy, you're smiling. Did you want to say something? Wait, you're muted. You're, you're muted. You're muted. No? Was that a no? Okay. We, we, can't, we you. can't hear you because you're muted. Sorry. Yes. Uh, no, I just liked your merciful. Hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> your comments. <laughs> okay. The um, the commentary that goes on. Okay. Um, so in so that's why we can see whenever there's a there's a there's a um, a break in the story, something dramatic happens like barrenness. A woman who's barren and a man who's barren as, as a couple, they're barren. Um, they, their life is very different from a couple who has have children whenever, you know, they want to have a child, they have a child. May take a little bit of time, may not, but they have a child. You develop a very different relationship with, with God. And I can tell you through the years of, of barrenness, um, you know, I have a very strong relationship with God, very, 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 very strong. Um, and God was, I felt very, very close, but it was a relationship of, of those who are barren. And, um, and someone who didn't go through this experience will probably not understand it. Will understand it intellectually, but not fully um, understand the, the experience. Um, so, um, so this is the point where El Shaddai appears. El Shaddai is the God of fertility. That's why, Ed, you asked earlier about the feminine aspect of God. And I told you, mm, maybe, maybe El Shaddai is somewhat the feminine aspect. El Shaddai comes from breasts, as I said earlier. And El Shaddai is the, the nurturing God. But the nurturing, not the, you know, the loving kindness, nurturing in a very physical sense it is both um, issues of prosperity just prosperity you know abundance He's, it's the god of abundance abundance of children abundance of wheat abundance of food just the the god of the many the plenty the god of the plenty 
That's El Shaddai. Now, I used to be an Arabic teacher. My bachelor's degree is in is Islam and Arabic. And so the word Shaddai in Arabic comes to the word, share a similar root from Shadid. Shadid means powerful, but powerful in the sense of plenty, not powerful in the sense of warrior, and, but powerful in the, in the sense of abundance. Um, so it's, it's at this point that all of a sudden El Shaddai starts appearing in the text. Now, the narrator, whoever wrote it, whether, whether it was Moses from the, word of, from the words of God or doesn't matter, it really doesn't matter. And we hear Adonai, and, you know, Hashem and Elohim. What, um, however, what, um, um, what Abraham encounters here is El Shaddai. When God appears to Abraham and says to him, Go forth, leave everything. You are setting off, setting out, setting out on a journey to a child. That's your journey. Abraham's journey was one single journey. A journey to Isaac. A journey to his child. And along the way, he had a son from, um, from Hagar, Yishmael. Um, and then, and then he had a son, and then he had later on he had more children after Sarah passed away, um, and he has. And we can see what happens to Abraham. Um, you know, when God says, "And you will be a blessing," the blessings that we're talking about is the blessing of abundance. Your children, Ra Rabbi, just... Rabbi, can you can you quote the 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 sentence where El Shaddai appears to Abraham? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, first of all, we saw how um, God says to Moshe, I appear to him as El Shaddai. Yeah. Um, and we'll, we will get to it in a few, well, actually, in a few minutes, we'll get to that because it's clear actually in, um, with, with Jacob, it's actually clear. And with Jacob is going to say, I'm the God of your grandfather, of, you know, of your father, Abraham, and your father, Isaac. And um, he's going to like present himself. Here, here's my, here's my, um, What's it called? Curtis be cool. Um, my calling card. Calling, calling card. Calling yeah. card. My calling card. No, El Shaddai. Um, but yes, we will we will get that. But mm -hmm. notice what, how he says to him, um, I will make make of you a great nation. And we're talking in numbers throughout the whole dis um, discussion between Abraham and God in the in the in the chapters ahead. It's all about numbers. It's all about numbers. And you know, it's, we're talking about Isaac, you know, where are the numbers here? And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I'll bless those, those who bless you and curse him that curses you and all the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you. Now, if we read Abraham's stories, wherever Abraham goes, he becomes abundant. Not only does he become abundant, but his surroundings become abundant as well. He, he's like, he's the, the charm. You know, that wherever he appears, abundance follows him. And he slowly but surely becomes wealthier and wealthier to such a point where him and his nephew Lot, when they come back from Egypt, what happens? What happens when they go down to Egypt? They go down to Egypt and, and Pharaoh sees Sarah and she's beautiful. Um, and he takes her and, and Abraham says to Sarah, tell them you're my sister because otherwise they'll kill me in order to, in order to take you because you're so beautiful, which is a very problematic text, of course, um, but that's not our topic. Um, um, but what happens is Sarah is barren. The minute she enters the palace, the whole palace becomes barren. None of Pharaoh's, none of the women in the palace, says in the text, and have, you know, God stops them all from birthing, from birthing, from having children. They all become barren. They're cursed with barrenness. So Sarah brings her barrenness with her. And eventually when Pharaoh says, go, God appears to him. And Pharaoh says to Abraham, just go. And he sends him off with, with a lot of wealth, with a lot of wealth, and as well as Hagar, 
Hagar, his concubine, she also joins the clan um, and she's going to, she is fertile. And Pharaoh says to him, but pray for me because God has stopped, has, has, has blocked our wombs. Pray to God to open up our wombs. And that's the God that Abraham talks to. Abraham, Abraham prays to the God of fertility. That's his, um, that's his conversation because that's his God. Um, and indeed, that's what happens. And, and, and the barrenness is, is, um, is removed from Pharaoh's, from Pharaoh's home, from Pharaoh's, from, from the, um, the castle. Um, and, um, and, and Abraham returns to the land of Canaan with, it be, comes back as a very wealthy man. So much so that him and Lot, his nephew, have to part ways because they, the land cannot, cannot handle their abundance. And then again, same thing happens when he goes down again to, um, he already has Ishmael, and then he goes down to, um, to Gerar, the second time there's a drought. And notice the story, the, there are two stories, ongoing stories in the book of Genesis. Bereshit, barrenness and droughts. These are the two stories that keep on repeating. They repeat in, for, in every one of them, and certainly they repeat for Abraham, they repeat for Isaac, and they repeat for, for Jacob, which is why they went down to Egypt. And, and the connection between the two is the connection between, between fertility, the fertility of women and men, and the fertility of the earth. We're all, it's all about abundance because the God of Genesis is the God of El Shaddai. Now, it's not just El Shaddai. It's the El Shaddai that you have to pray to because El Shaddai um, kind of can control fertility. So if you want abundance, it's not enough to just work the land. You've got to, you've got to pray. You've got to pray to, to the God of abundance, and that's who they pray to time and time again. Um, and I've, I, kind of, I've likened El Shaddai. When we'll talk about Elohim, which is usually the generic name for God, when we'll talk about Elohim, Elohim is going to be the God of nature. Now you could say, well, birth, like fertility and crops, that's all nature. No, it's not. Nature, sometimes there is and sometimes there isn't. Sometimes it rains and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you're, you know, you're um, fertile, sometimes you're barren. That's nature. El Shaddai is when you're, when you're barren, you go to fertility doctors. And they pump you with hormones, a lot of hormones. That's, I think, a really interesting metaphor for El Shaddai. <laughs> El Shaddai is nature enhanced. Is Abraham just doesn't become just like wealthy. He becomes very, very wealthy. You know, he um, it's all everything is to the extreme in, in a good way. Now the the master the master of el shaddai we're moving fast fast forward for a moment we'll come back to Abraham, but we're moving right now fast forward who in the torah is the ultimate master of el shaddai it's okay if you, if you don't know but kind of any any guesses from the story i'll give you a hint who's the master of abundance um, hmm. Is it Jacob for having so many kids? Jacob has a lot of kids. Jacob certainly, Jacob, whew, Jacob had a really, really good relationship with El Shaddai, but there's someone who even was more than Jacob. But continue on that track. You're on the track, on the right track. Which is why that person is Jacob's beloved son. So Joseph. 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 Think of Joseph's role. Joseph is kind of this. There's famine in the Middle East. Seven years of famine. 
and he organizes stores and, um, and of abundance. His God is God of El Shaddai. Look at his dreams. His dreams are all about abundance. <clears throat> and he is, he is the master of abundance, which is why it's Joseph, it's Yosef, who's going to bring us all down to Egypt. Egypt is the land of abundance. It's not a coincidence that Joseph ends up in Egypt and after him, all the, you know, the rest of the family is down in Egypt because Egypt is the flesh pots. Egypt is the land of abundance. Only the abundance doesn't come from the heavens. It comes from the Nile River. It comes from nature. It comes from Elohim, from nature. In the land of, of Israel, we always have um, um, droughts. As, as a child, our obsession, if there's one obsession that every Israeli shares is, as the rain season begins, after every spell of rain, everybody wants to know, ooh, how many centimeters or inches has the Kinneret risen? We're obsessed with the Kinneret. Until Israel became a, uh, a world leader in, in desalinization, is that what it's called? Yeah. 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 Right. Um, and we, we depended on the Kinneret. And I, I still, I'm 57 years old. And I certainly know the feeling of anxiety. Oh no, there are no rains. Oh no. And you hear on the news, the Kinneret is like dropping. And, and I, I remember in my lifetime, like five consecutive years of drought. And the Kinneret, I was born and raised in the Upper Galilee and Kinneret was next, next door. I was literally born and raised on, on the Jordan River. Um, so we would walk on Shabbat, we would walk down to the Kinneret. And I remember the years when the Kinneret was like shrinking. You had to walk from the, from the lovely beach and all the, you know, the umbrella, the, you know, whatever they're called. And you had to walk to the water. And in some places, you even had a little cart taking you to the water. That's how far it was. And, and then what a joy. It doesn't matter. Do we have wars? It doesn't matter. Terrorism. When the Kinneret fills up, there's nothing that makes an Israeli more joyful. <laughs> um, and so it's really, um, what, were you going to say something, Jeremy? Uh, no, it's like yeah, you know, when, when, when you finish your thought, I got, I got, I got something to say. Yeah. Okay. So, so Egypt is the land of abundance, but it comes from the river. It's horizontal. In the land of Israel, abundance comes from the rain, i.e., from the heavens. And when you look at the story of creation, there's one day in which. It doesn't say good. And there are two creations about which God, God doesn't say good. One is the heaven, and the other is the human being. And from that point on, the Torah matches the two together. In the land of Israel, rain will fall if the human being will be good. It's, it's not good from the get-go. It's not everything is good except for two things, rain and the human being. And the two things in the land of Israel, the two things are connected. We read in the Shema, you know, twice a day. If you'll be good, there'll be rain and there'll be abundance. If you won't be good, if you won't listen to the Lord your God, um, you won't have rain and you will starve. It's terrific. So it's going to, it's a, um, so it's a really, yes, yeah, so we're, we're, about, we're about to end. So maybe I'll, I'll shut up now and maybe, um, Jeremy, you were going to say or ask a comment. Yeah, I'm finding this really uh, uh, fascinating and revelatory because I, I always was told uh, that, you know, before uh, Avram, before uh, Avraham, uh, the, the, the Canaan and, and everyone was with, with these, these uh, clay, a start day, um, a start of uh, fertility gods and goddesses. And fertility, fertility was something that the Jewish people rejected as soon as we got Avraham. And so this is really fascinating that we were really praying to a God of fertility and abundance. This was goes against everything that I, <laughs> that I was always taught. That's really beautiful. It's really beautiful. I'm so glad, you know, I was going to talk about all these figures when we talk about El, 
because it appears under, you know, and um, but it's beautiful you brought them now. Yes, all the all the gods and goddesses and all the idols were all so many of them were idols of fertility. And um, by the way, in in this region mostly in this region in areas where fertility or abundance was not. Uh, where, where you don't live by a great river like the Euphrates and um, and the Nile, and um, but right indeed they they knew that like Abraham's revolution was that fertility is not going to come from a little figurine. It's not going to come from a little thing that you hold and you kind of um, maybe you you feed it or whatever. That it's going to come that fertility really comes from, 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 from elsewhere. So it's like a, a little, it's, a, it's an evolution of, of, it's an evolution of, of the God of fertility. Um, the God of fertility like evolved into El Shaddai. The goddesses of fertility evolved into El Shaddai. But and you're absolutely right, the word Shaddai from breasts, all, all these figurines that you're talking about all have big yes. Yes. Because they're part of fertility. Yes. This is fascinating. So, so it's going to be really interesting as we'll, um, ne next time we meet, um, you know, if Yosef with El Shaddai brings us down to Egypt, we started here with Va'era. They are deep in the mud of Egypt, of El Shaddai, of abundance, of overabundance. They're spoiled. They're, they're like, now they need a different quality, a different divine quality, a different God to take them out of the overabundance. They are very much, I think, like Western society. We are so spoiled and so, you know, deep in the mud of, of consumerism and, and, you know, money can get us everything. And, and people are, are like, there must be more than that. There must be, you know, we know already that jo the joy cannot be, you know, bought in Costco. And we know that, um, it, that meaning comes not from the American dream of the lovely house and the two cars, now it's three or four, um, and two kids and a dog. We know there's something, as you say, much more than that. Um, so so in, in Exodus, that more than that appears and we'll we'll continue with that like next time we uh we meet which is what is that that's next week right exactly the same time thank you so much rabbi wolfen this was so elucidating and, and great and uh yes we maybe we'll get more people in too but in any event it's recorded this was absolutely wonderful thank you so much and see you next week and spread the word People can join in, right? It's not it's not a closed yeah. circle. Absolutely. We'll do a short recap and then we'll go into the excellent. Next. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, great. Have a wonderful day. Okay. Bye, Lito. Bye. Bye, Lito. Thank you. That was wonderful. I think Jeremy gets a lot of pleasure out of the abundance in Costco, actually. I do. <laughs> <laughs> is, that where, is that where he gets his chickpeas from? No, no, no. I make my chickpeas dry and then, then, I, then I, I put them in the pressure cooker. But no, um, I'm, waiting, I'm waiting for hummus. It's been a long time. <laughs> you're right. I got to. <laughs> but that, thank you for your comment, Debbie. I agree. OK, we'll spread the word. Yeah, yeah. He, I mean, Ed, Ed got off, but Ed's got yesterday the seminary. I don't know how JTS does it. Five hundred some people are on. For this Monday afternoon class, I'm not joking. Jeremy, wow. I tuned in a couple of times because Alan Cooper was on yesterday. So even that list, you know, you might want to send something to Ed. I don't know how you get to wow. JPS, but get get more people on. Okay, cool. I That's thought, wonderful. You know, I kind of did it and was like, okay, you know, but he really was good. Yeah, thank you. How did I, you find? I, how did you find him? Through the Masorati, okay. the Masorati Foundation sure. said that because of COVID. Um, we can share our Masorti rabbis in Israel with the whole world if your time works. And so they put out a list of people and uh, this sounded interesting. Oh, yeah, he definitely was. Yeah, great. So see you next week. Okay. Jeremy? Uh, all right. Bye -bye. Yes. Yeah. I, I think it would, 
a, be a really good idea if the day before you sent out um, an email, a special email, email. because yeah. Okay. Signed up it's hard to remember. And if I don't get that remind, I mean, this one, I obviously it, I don't need the reminder email, but, but other, that's a great other idea. People kind of like, oh, I missed it, especially with the time. Right. If you sent it the, a day. Yeah, before, with the with the people have links, so they don't have um, to. Look I, I find it helpful for my own calendars because sometimes I'm I'm over signed up, you know. Yes, yeah, so yeah. I'll, I'll I'll do that. Me too. I'll do that. That's an excellent right. idea. Yeah. yeah okay. Great. Um, and it's and funny you can though that five stars, five stars from the people that attend. Right. Oh, yeah. Susan, <laughs> I have to share this with you since you know Yiddish. I was I was you know in Toronto for a month. I'll share it with Debbie too. And uh, my my mother said, you know, your grandmother, your Bubba, always called uh, uh, Dinstick Tuesday a Mazel Dicket Tog. Why? Why was it the lucky day? Because on, on the third day, Tuesday's the third day, it says twice, and God saw that it was good. Well, I think Thursday's also when. Um, it's Thursday. No, but this is Thursday. Tuesday. Thursday's Tuesday. a different thing because we. Tuesday, to it's, and, 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 and we look and it says, yes, twice it says about the third day, God saw it was good. So I, I, my, my grandmother wasn't a Torah scholar, but it must have been part of Jewish culture. Tuesday was a Mazel Dikatog. Well, I know when Lucky we day. moved, my uncle said to me, um, change your place and change your life, you know. Sure, Mishan, Mish, in Yiddish, it's Mishana <laughs> yes, Makom, Mishana yes. Mazel. Oh, yeah. Mishana Makom, Mishana Mazel. <laughs> Katie, see you all soon. Hey, hey, thanks a lot. This was fabulous. You're welcome. Okay, yeah, wonderful.